Today's interview is with David Schonthal. David is clinical professor of innovation and entrepreneurship at the Kellogg School of Management, where he also serves as the faculty director of Kellogg's Zell Fellows Program. David has spent a decade at world-renowned design firm IDEO and currently serves as an operating partner at Seven Wire Ventures, a healthcare technology-focused venture capital firm. David is a global advisor at Design for Ventures, a Tokyo-based early stage venture capital fund that invests in design-led Japanese startups. And David is the co-founder of Matter, a 25,000 square foot innovation center in downtown Chicago, focused on catalyzing and supporting healthcare entrepreneurship. He is the co-author of the upcoming book, The Human Element, Overcoming the Resistance that awaits new ideas, along with Professor Lauren Nordgren, also of the Kellogg School. Hello, David. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Um, the Human Element is being published this October. How can I get a copy of your book when it comes out? <laughs> uh, I love that we're getting right into the marketing. Um, <laughs> so yes, it comes out on October 5th. You can order copies through Amazon, local bookstores, uh, as well as directly through the book's landing page, which is humanelementbook.com, but through typical channels. Great, perfect. Um, the book addresses the question of what makes an idea take flight and introduces the concept of friction. What is friction and how can an entrepreneur embrace friction theory to his or her advantage? Sure, and maybe by way of background, I'll just give you a little bit of the origin story of the work. So I've spent my career, as you mentioned at IDEO, but also in the startup space with, with startup companies and well, as well as the venture space, investing in disruptive companies. And for the majority of my career, I spent my time focused on how to make ideas better, how to make products or services more disruptive, uh, how to create value with, with new innovations. And then was always left scratching my head about why, despite the fact that these products or services or strategies were gonna make a meaningful dent in the world or meaningful impact in the world, why they failed to get traction in the market. And for a long time spent my effort and my energy focused on making the idea better. Like surely it's something wrong with the idea. So I need to add a feature, I need to add a benefit, I need to talk about it differently, I need to promote it differently. And while sometimes that would move the needle a bit, it wouldn't move the needle in the way that I was expecting. And so over the last four or five years, along with Lauren Nordgren, who's a Kellogg faculty member and a colleague of mine, started to dive into what is it, not so much on the, on the side of the idea or the product, but what is it about the audience that we're trying to serve that makes them resistant to new ideas, despite how good those ideas might be. And Lauren has a background in behavioral psychology, my background is obviously in the applied in the applied world, and together we went about trying to figure out how uh, how these forces of friction, as you mentioned, stand in the way of progress. And to answer the question, I think most innovators, particularly product and service oriented innovators, tend to think about the product or service as the hero of the story. If something isn't computing, let's do something with the idea to make it better. We, by writing this book, are attempting to focus on the other side of the equation, which are all of the forces or headwinds that stand in the way of a new idea, how to forecast them, overcome them, and smooth them so that great ideas successfully make it to market. In, in the book, you identify four frictions. Um, you know, what are those four frictions? Um, you know, briefly, I mean, we're going to get the book, so we'll go into in, in depth. Uh, when it comes out, but um, what are the four frictions? Sure. So the four forces that work against new ideas, as we define it in the book, are number one, what we call inertia or the habit of the present. Human beings, because of just our normal human being psychology and wiring, tend to be creatures of habit. And sometimes, despite the fact that we know there's a better way to do something, our habits of the present keep us anchored in what we're currently doing instead of getting us enabling us to change. So the first friction is inertia. The second friction we've identified in this book is about effort. Uh, 
And effort can mean the physical exertion required to make a change. It can also mean the economic exertion required to make a change. And sometimes it's just the, the ambiguity of making the change itself. So inertia is one, mm -hmm. effort is two. The third is emotion, which are all of the negative feelings or feelings of anxiety that our new solution creates in other people. Oftentimes hiding below the surface and not necessarily known to us, but anytime you're asking somebody to change, there's usually a variety of negative emotions that need to be addressed or concerns that need to be addressed in order for that change to take place. And the fourth is something we refer to as reactance. And a reactance is a human being's aversion to being changed by others. And I think if you look at uh, current events in the, the United States, you can see plenty of examples of reactance swirling around you. And each of these frictions are present to some degree or another when major change is going to take place. But the question for the innovator or the entrepreneur is, to what degree are each of these frictions standing in my way and how might I go about mitigating them so that I can be successful? Does the concept of friction apply only to products and services or can it also apply to companies with product lines? So um, all of the above. I, I think it applies to any example where you're trying to get someone to change to something new. Uh, so I, I use friction theory a lot with our portfolio companies in the entrepreneurship space with corporations when it comes to corporate innovation and teaching our students about how to spot this when they're building new companies. But I also use it when I'm negotiating with my 10 year old and when I'm dealing with interpersonal dynamics inside of an organization. The reason the book is called The Human Element is it's less about the thing and more about the human beings that you hope will adopt the thing. And that can be product, service, strategy, movement, social change, any of the above. Um, what about ne negative effects? Can the efforts to overcome friction have the potential to actually increase friction? Yeah, um, that's a great question, actually. Um, it, it, it can, particularly when we're blind to the frictions that exist for a new idea. So again, most innovators instincts, like if somebody's looking at a new idea and they're not adopting it, our bias, because we look at the world through our own lens and not necessarily through the lens of the people we're trying to help, our bias is to change how we explain it. We're not talking about it the right way. It's not being featured the right way. There's missing pieces to this. The price is too high. And we always look at the the change or the source of the change is the thing that we need to affect. And sometimes by adding a feature, or adding a benefit or changing the price, we actually increase anxiety or we increase the amount of effort or exertion required to adopt it. When in fact, sometimes the way to get somebody to change isn't to change the idea, it's to make it easier for them to say yes, which is about removing friction and not adding what we would call fuel uh, to the idea. And, and what exactly is that? You, you, you use the term a fuel-based mindset. Um, what is a fuel-based mindset and how can it be changed? Yeah, so um, in addition to friction theory, friction theory is built on the foundation of a, a wide variety of other theories in management science as well as psychological science. Um, one theory that I really feel strongly about is jobs theory, which was popularized by Clay Christensen and Bob Mesta. And that's a pretty good way of explaining fuel and friction at a high level. Uh, Bob and Clay talk about anytime you're trying to get somebody to change from what they're doing today to what you'd like to do in the future, there are opposing forces at play. Two forces that push people towards change and two forces that push people away from change. The forces that push people towards change are the what we would call the push of the situation or the recognition that the status quo is not working and something will need to change. Even though it might not need to change today, there's something going on in my life that makes me recognize that whatever I'm doing to make the progress I seek is not adequate and I'm going to need to find a new solution. The second force that propels people towards change is the magnetism of that new solution. All of the features and benefits and value that comes from adopting that new solution. And I imagine that many of my entrepreneurship um, academic colleagues will attest, most entrepreneurs kind of stop there. It's like problem, solution, and we're done. And they fail to recognize that there's actually forces moving people away from the change. And the way that Bob and Clay explain it in, in jobs is force three is the anxiety that that new solution creates. 
yeah, I know that there's something else I need to do that's better than what I'm doing today. And yeah, that product seems pretty cool, but you know, it's got a bunch of features and benefits that I'm not sure I'm going to use. So why should I have to pay for it if I'm not going to use it? Or I'm not sure I'm going to be able to learn how to adopt it quickly enough. And I'm a little bit anxious about having to get back up the learning curve for something brand new. Even though my current solution isn't great, I'm going to stick with it because it's what I know, which is that fourth force or Bob, what Bob and Clay refer to as the habit of the present. Then this is similar to inertia, the status quo. And what we know is that if force one and force two are not greater than force three and force four, nobody will change, which is where you see the phenomenon of the abandoned cart in e-commerce. People are obviously compelled to explore a new solution. They've identified one solution out of an array of solutions and they've put it in their basket and they're sort of prototyping in their mind what it would be like to integrate this thing into their lives. But something stands in the way of them actually pushing by. And what we're trying to understand in friction theory is like, what is it that happens in some, inside of somebody's head once they've already identified that this might be something that's interesting to them? What is it that gets them to walk away at the last minute? And how do we help them persist through the process instead of getting spooked and walk away? So our focus is on those other two forces, which frankly we feel doesn't get enough attention in the entrepreneurship curriculum. It doesn't get enough attention in the innovation space. And, um, and as an entrepreneur who is, uh, you know, as a, a founder entrepreneur myself, um, I'm very familiar with getting uh, a potential customer uh, right to the point. Um, they're saying yes, 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 and then they're gone. And um, that's so frustrating. And uh, uh, that's why I'm looking forward to your book. Uh, I need to I need to address that. Um, in terms of for Clay Christensen, just uh, so that if people want to do some research on their own, that's mm. the 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 full name is the jobs to be done theory, right? Is that? Yeah. Uh, jobs to be done or the theory of jobs to be done. Okay. Popularized in Clay's book, Competing Against Luck, which he wrote with Karen Dillon and, and Taddy Hall and David Duncan. Uh, but Jobs is is manifested itself in a variety of ways. In fact, one book that I really like recently is one that Bob Mester wrote called Demand Side Sales, which is applying jobs specifically to the process of sales, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. What, um, what is the difference between the symptoms of friction versus the causes of friction? Um, how much time do we have? <laughs> so, so quite a bit. I mean, particular, well, so of the four frictions, so again, inertia, effort, uh, emotion, and reactance, some of them are a bit easier to identify. Like you can typically identify the amount of effort required to get somebody to change. If you do a journey map or you look at how to streamline the experience, you can pretty accurately diagnose where somebody's exerting more than they ought to or where you're making a process unnecessarily complicated when it could be simplified. I will say that that emotion and reactants tend to be more difficult to spot because you're right, what we see are the symptoms of emotional friction. Rarely are people willing to be self-aware enough and vulnerable enough to say, you know, Philip, uh, your, your product seems really interested, interesting, but I'm going to afraid that I'm afraid that I'm going to appear like a Luddite to my colleagues if I adopt it and don't know how to use it. People won't typically share outwardly all of the deep rooted concerns they have about why they might not do something that could benefit them in the long run. So what we have to be careful about when addressing friction is not necessarily to address the symptoms of the friction because the symptoms uh, don't get to the root cause of what's going on underneath. We need to have methods to understand and identify what's really going on below the surface in order to be able to identify the ways that we might resolve those frictions. And what I will say, um, perhaps optimistically, is that usually when we identify the root cause of a problem, the solution becomes pretty obvious. It's just the trick of identifying the root cause underneath it when people are not necessarily inclined to be expressive and verbose about all of their anxieties. How do we help them identify those for us and how do we observe them in their natural context? Are there cultural or geographic frictions um, or are frictions, as you have outlined them, universal elements that operate within all humans? Um, are there circumstantial frictions that can occur? 
Oh, sure. Contextual frictions all the time. I mean, I do think there's a certain set of frictions that are not unique uh, to certain cultures. I think they're just human conditions. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think all four of these frictions are present in any change movement, whether you're doing it here in Dubai or in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, now, the extent to which they show up and the level of opposition they may pose can be different from culture to culture. And things that might be uh, friction inducing in another country may not have the, the friction induction that they've got in the United States. For example, we talk in the book uh, in a case study about uh, the, uh, the Emirate of Dubai in the UAE and relevant to this audience a few years ago. The, the government of Dubai wanted to catalyze more university level entrepreneurship for Emirati students. Historically, mm -hmm. unlike at Stanford or in the United States and the West Coast of the United States, most students in Emirati universities, most Emirati students in Emirati universities don't aspire to becoming their own boss when they graduate to have the autonomy of entrepreneurship and all of the allure that comes to launching that next big thing. Mm -hmm. For a long time, the aspiration for many Emirati were to uh, get a job in the government and be of civil service, which happens to pay significantly more than it does in civil service in the United States. But the idea of taking risk and starting something new was much less interesting than going for a steady paying job in social service in the government. But what the Emirati, what the Dubai government and what the, the head of the ruler of Dubai had identified is what the company with the culture had historically relied on as an opportunity and area for growth, which was energy production specifically around oil was a waning competitive advantage. Their oil reserves were drying up. And in addition to having lots of free trade and big business in the Middle East, Dubai was gonna have to find a new way to maintain relevance for the future. And they saw this opportunity in university students. Can we get them to think differently about old problems and create new value similar to where they've seen it done in other cultures around the world? So on the surface, the solution is relatively apparent. Let's take what works in Berlin. Let's take what works in the Valley. Let's take what works in New York and try to replicate it here in Dubai. Let's create incubators and accelerators and a university education program. And, and that to some extent is what they did. And they found sort of like the abandoned card example that a lot of students were interested in learning about entrepreneurship and interested in taking these classes, but weren't willing to take that entrepreneurial leap. And to make a relatively long story uh, more concise, when they dug into understanding what it was that stood in the way of university entrepreneurship students actually deciding to take up the mantle of becoming entrepreneurs as a potential career path, it wasn't the entrepreneur that was the problem. It wasn't the lack of preparation in the university was the problem. It wasn't even the financing that was the problem. One of the biggest problems they identified was the parents. The parents of these university students who thought, you know, my child is going through four years of education and now they're going to give away or give up a, a steady career in, in civil service and instead start their own thing, which is really high risk. And by the way, failure is looked at very differently in Dubai than it's looked at in Silicon Valley, as is, as is the case in Asia and other parts of the world, where in the United States, we're sort of used to moving fast and breaking things and fail fast and all that jazz. In other countries, in other cultures around the world, like, whoa, like fail fast, what? So um, this problem with getting the parents comfortable with entrepreneurship was a really interesting challenge for the Dubai Future Foundation. And in order to address this problem, what the Dubai Future Foundation wound up doing was employing a very sophisticated strategy uh, that was the following. Anytime a Emirati University student wanted to pursue entrepreneurship as a path after graduation, the parents of that student would receive in the mail a thank you note from His Highness Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum saying, thank you, parents, for enabling your child to, uh, to, to hear, to, to respond to this, this national call to create more innovation and entrepreneurship in Dubai. And simply by receiving this very personal accolade from His Highness, these families were now filled with pride where before they were filled with anxiety, it was something they could share with their community. And when people started to realize that the government was acknowledging not necessarily the successful launch of the business, but even just the attempt, it changed people's perception to, 
how to overcome this friction of, of anxiety from parents. And so long way of answering your question, Philip, which is the sources of friction are going to be different everywhere in the world. It's just a matter of identifying it again. Treating the symptoms is not good enough. It's not about adding an incubator. It's not about adding a new class. Treating the underlying friction, which is the anxiety of the parent being projected onto the child that really needs to be addressed for progress to happen. Um, so how can an innovator entrepreneur interview customers to get to the why of friction, which is what you were just talking about, mm. that underlies the what of friction? Yeah. Um, you know, it's in your example, I mean, it's, you know, it, it was a, you know, a happy ending and you identified it, but I'm, you know, I'm the entrepreneur innovator. I'm interviewing my, you know, customer client base. Mm -hmm. How do I get there? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think you've sort of answered the question in the question itself, which is, which is getting to the why underneath the what. Okay. And I think the short answer is most people don't ask why enough. Most okay. entrepreneurs will say, why is it that you want to pursue entrepreneurship or what's, you know, why is it that entrepreneurship is an interesting uh, career path for you? And they'll say, oh, because I want to serve my country or I want to, to create disruptive change. Well, why do you want to create disruptive change? Well, because my family business is in a domain that's being commodified and in order for us to succeed in the future, we're going to have to think of new ways of doing things, both as a family business, but also as a culture. Well, why is it important for you to do that? And like most of us, uh, I'm sure everybody who, who's listening to this in some way, shape or form has heard of the five whys with the Toyota production okay. system and even in customer research or, or design research. And I think many of us intellectually get the five whys, like you ask why five times, but doing it in practice is really awkward. It's super awkward. You don't want to sit there and be like, why? 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 Because, and also you'll see the person on the other side of the table get uncomfortable. And the moment that you see them get uncomfortable, you usually pull back and you're like, okay, I I've taken this too far. So there've got to be ways of staying in the question elegantly mm -hmm. to allow people to get to the underlying root cause of what's holding them back. And uh, in the book, we talk about some techniques, both in terms of interviewing and question asking, but also that no question you ask will be as um, revealing is having people show you. And so the importance of ethnographic research and the importance engage, of engaging in empathy exercises uh, and how to go about doing that in a way that not only helps you understand what's standing in their way, but what's going on underneath. And again, the nice thing is typically when you under, when you spot the why or the, the root cause, the solution is relatively apparent and pretty elegant. It's a great motivator to get there. But um, it takes practice. like. I, I'm, I'm serious. It takes a lot of uh, time to, to get comfortable staying in five whys worth of questions. Should an entrepreneur interview herself to identify friction before interviewing customers? <laughs> uh, I've never heard that question before. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess if you're really self-aware and have the ability to be to totally objective, that then perhaps, but I, I find typically to get to the real reasons people do things, it's always good to be at least one degree, if not two degrees of separation away from yourself. So when I'm advising our entrepreneurial students at Kellogg to do interviews with customers, it's never interview your friends or interview your family, because to some extent, they're interested in telling you a little bit about what you want to hear. They're interested in supporting your feelings and nobody's going to be a jerk and be like, no, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. But usually when you move two or three degrees away from that personal connection, there's a lot more objectivity. There's a lot more, um, there's a lot less bias in terms of how they think it will affect you as the innovator. So I'm usually a much bigger advocate of interviewing people that are distant from you than interviewing people that are close to you, which I guess, by definition would include yourself, but, <laughs> but to the extent that you have experienced the problem you're trying to solve, I think if you can be objective and can be a little introspective on, all right, if I were to take my founder hat off and think about this from when I was in this situation, the last time I was thinking about adopting something new, whether it's something like this product or this service or the strategy or not, what was it that made me think twice? The last time that I abandoned a cart in this situation, what was it that made me think twice? And some people are able to really be objective and say, you know what, 
it was the intimidation of the new product or it was the unclear cost benefit or it was the amount of ambiguity in terms of how I would get started. But um, again, that takes a pretty high degree of self-awareness of the, the introspector. Um, in terms of ethics, um, what is the line between ethical influence and manipulation? Yeah, um, this is important and, and something we, we try to touch on right away in the book. In fact, Lauren, who's an expert in influence and persuasion, is very clear right up front about where that line is drawn. And the way that we draw that line in this book is around intention. Um, if your intention is to deceive and mislead for personal gain, yes, friction theory can be applied for nefarious intent, but the book is really written ar around helping people make meaningful uh, progress in their lives, which um, is is really just boiled down to intention going in uh, to the experience from the beginning. So what is your intention? That's usually the difference between sort of the wrong side of where we think the ethical line is in this book and the right side. Um, so uh, it, it's it, along those lines then, um, what role does uh, trust play in identifying frictions? <sighs> Um, interesting question. Say more about what you mean by that. Well, it, it's, I guess it's, it's along the lines of, you know, the, the interviewing to get to the whys, mm. um, and, you know, the, the engendering trust so that, uh, the potential customer is not feeling manipulated. Yeah. Um, it, it may just be an obvious answer to the question, you know, what, what role does trust play? Yeah, it's important. Well, no, it's, it's a fair, I think if you're asking somebody to be vulnerable and authentic, obviously there's a, a level of minimum level of trust required. There are several interviewing techniques that I think do a great job of engendering trust in making interviews feel more like a conversation and less like an interrogation. But I think that if the person you're trying to help and the innovator are literally sitting on the same side of the table or figuratively sitting on the same side of the table and being clear about the progress they're trying to help people make, I think trust is pretty quickly developed. Most people are interested in helping to invent solutions to, to, to solve their problem. And we talk in this book about the importance of co-design, designing with your customers, designing with your audience in order to not only build trust, but also to help remove that fourth force of friction we talked about, which is reactance, which is somebody's aversion to being changed. And one of the ways you can help people adopt change is to help them be involved in the process of designing the change itself. And then it's no longer change being imposed. It's now I've got pride of inventorship and authorship in this solution. And therefore, it's not me adopting your idea. It's me adopting the idea that we've co-created together. So. Uh, I think you see trust show up with each of these frictions, but in, in slightly different ways. What can educators incorporate into the into teaching entrepreneurs um, how to survey customers to identify friction? I think it's just, first of all, acknowledging that it's present. I think a lot of us hope that if the idea is good enough, that there's no headwind that will stop it because look, the, the, the plane is taken off and it's, it's on its way up. And I think just recognizing that anytime you're trying to get somebody to do something new, that there are these forces that stand in the way and knowing that they're there is really uh, the first and most important step. And then second is part of the design process. And I'm sure this audience has worked with Alex Osterwalder's business model canvas or Steve Blank's lean methodology. And there are a variety of tools and frameworks that help with that, but also as part of the design process or the innovation process using, we've got a couple of tools in the book, one called a friction map that helps people anticipate the sources of friction that might be standing in their way and at least acknowledge that they may be out there and keeping an eye on them. And once we experiment and validate that they're present, then we can prototype with some specific remedies about how to overcome them. And in the book, the book is organized where there are two chapters on every friction, one helping you diagnose the friction and the amount of that friction present and some methods to do that to your point. But then the second chapter is now that you've identified it, how do you overcome and how do you remedy those frictions? And so we've tried to divide the, the book into those two pieces, diagnosis and remedy. Uh, and depending on the friction, they're all a little bit different. 
Um, you mentioned Steve Blank. So Steve Blank uh, has endorsed the human element. Um, and he has said at one point that uh, there is a fine line between vision and hallucination. Uh, <laughs> In the, the human element, you argue that people have the wrong intuitions about how to sell new ideas and create change, and that friction is rarely considered. Um, is this the hallucination that Steve is referring to? Uh, I, I don't know, and I, and I wouldn't want to put words in Steve's mouth. I think that, that maybe what Steve is referring to, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, is that in order to be a truly disruptive innovator, you need to be able to see the world differently than other people. And you need to be able to spot opportunities where other might not see them. And sometimes that can be so grand that it appears to be a hallucination, but it's vision. Um, and then I think taming that and making it feasible, desirable, and viable is really the key for any entrepreneur, like marrying vision with reality and making those two things connect. I think that, that friction theory in, in what we're talking about in the human element is, again, not focused on the idea itself, but now that you've got the idea or now that you've identified the problem to solve, what are all of the different ways in which somebody might feel anxious about it or somebody might resist it? And I think, again, when we teach entrepreneurship, because we're teaching people lean and we're teaching them how to develop products, it's usually about going out and identifying a need, understanding that need, breaking it down to its component parts, figuring out what has to be true for that need to be addressed, prototyping and iterating different solutions, and then devising go-to-market plans to get that product out in the world. But usually our curriculum stops short of understanding why those products fail to achieve product market fit. And most of our instinct is it's either the wrong customer or it's the wrong offer. And what this book is saying is, in some cases, it's the right product for the right customer, but there are these psychological and human forces, human elements present that may make them um, hesitant to adopt. And so before we dismiss that there's no product market fit, how do we, instead of thinking about how to make the product different, think about developing the market differently to remove all of that headwind that stands in the way? Um, you also mentioned Alex Osterwilder. Um, Alex has also endorsed the human element. Um, Alex uses the term gravity creators. Hmm. Uh, is this the same as your approach to friction? Um, are they different? I think they're different. In, in the way that I understand gravity creation in Alex's terms is that, that really durable, invincible businesses tend to create gravitational pull to them, which allows them to persist as market conditions around them change. Uh, I think friction theory and looking at friction is a way of creating a gravity inducing idea or gravity inducing company, but instead of adding magnetism to the solution. It's about removing uh, some of the obstacles that stand in that in that solutions way. So let me give you an example. Uh, one of the chapters we, we talk about, um, well, there's a variety of different examples that I can bring to uh, come up with, but one of them is around uh, the anxiety of credit cards. We, you and I grew up in a time where people weren't particularly reluctant about using credit cards. They were relatively new. They wound up making our lives easier. We no longer had to take, pay cash. We could carry this little piece of plastic around, buy it now, pay for it later. And then all of these credit cards came with perks and points and benefits. And now I'm, not only am I getting to buy a new shirt, I don't have to pay for it now. And I get $80 or $50 worth of airline points to take my next trip. And credit card innovation began to be this arms race about features and benefits and uh, and uh, all of these different perks and, and things that came with each credit card. A few years ago, back in 2018, American Express, who never really got a whole lot of traction with younger consumers, wanted to think about how to create a credit card product that helped younger consumers who might not have thought about American Express begin to think about American Express as a way to meet their financial needs. What became clear through the research of understanding how millennials think about credit and credit cards is that we grew up in an era where credit cards were new and exciting and helpful, 
Millennials grew up in an era where they heard story after story after story about people going into debt, overspending beyond their means, not being able to get out of personal debt, reduction in credit scores. And so uh, many of them grew up being fearful of credit cards. Like, oof, I don't wanna have to use a credit card unless I need to. And with 14% APR, like why should I be paying 14% for buying a cup of coffee at Starbucks? And so millennials started compartmentalizing their sources of money depending on the need that they were having. So for coffee, they would pay cash. For things that were like under a hundred bucks or under the amount of cash they'd carry in their wallet or over the amount of cash they'd carry in their wallet, sorry, they might use a debit card because that didn't have the same risk of overspending beyond your means. And then for everything else, they carried an emergency credit card. And emergency credit cards were only for things that exceeded the amount of money you had in your savings account where you were comfortable depleting it. And we wouldn't use those for normal purchases. We'd only use those things for emergencies. And so one of the reasons that American Express was having trouble attracting younger consumers wasn't because of American Express. It was because younger consumers were just averse to credit cards. And the common way of helping people get on board with new ideas, like let's just add a new program or let's add a credit for airlines or let's add free insurance for car rentals or whatever. Like eventually that just became noise. And when Amex studied the anxieties of these young consumers. Like, why should I have to pay 14% interest rate on financing a latte? And when they sort of stripped it down to its component parts, it's not that people don't want the benefit of a credit card. They're just afraid of all of the murkiness that comes with it. Amex created a program called Keep the Change, or sorry, not Keep the Change. That's another example. Amex created a program called Pay It Planet, where now when you purchase, if you have an Amex credit card and you're enrolled in this program, every purchase you make, you can make the decision. Do I pay it full off now like I'm using cash or do I plan it? Meaning, do I pay it in installments over time? And when you choose a purchase to plan, so you might pay for a latte today, but when you choose to plan the purchase of a new television or a new gaming system, which might be three or four hundred dollars and you want to pay it off in six monthly installments, Amex will tell you right up front in the app exactly how much it will cost for you to finance that purchase for six months. And then you, as the, as the consumer, can say, all right, it's worth $20 for me to pay this over six months, or it's worth $15. And so they've got transparency to the financing costs right up front. They can pay directly like a debit card, things that, they're, that are small purchases so they don't have to feel anxious about it. And what started originally as a feature on a very specific credit card became so popular that Amex has now rolled this pay it planet feature out to every single credit card they have, recognizing that the way for them to grow the size of their market isn't to compete on features and benefits, it's to compete on removing the anxiety that stands in the way of every other credit card. So they're actually unlocking latent demand, which is one of the most powerful elements about friction and friction theory for entrepreneurs that you can actually turn non-consumers into consumers when you remove the right amount of friction. And the Pay It Planet story is an excellent example of that, but there's lots of examples of companies that have pivoted their attention away from features towards friction removal that have unlocked all sorts of latent demand that stood in people's way previously. It's a fascinating case study. Um, you teach uh, at IDEO um, the designing a business course. Yeah. Um, and IDEO is, uh, a, as we had mentioned earlier, is a global innovation and design consultancy. How does teaching for IDEO differ from teaching for the Kellogg School of Management? Um, more post-it notes. <laughs> uh, that's not actually true at all. Um, so I think the audiences are different. So Kellogg students are obviously here, or executive students, or, or executive MBA students, or full-time MBA students, are in our classrooms to for a long period of time to sort of learn how to skill themselves up or make transitions in their careers. And they come in with a fair amount of business acumen right from the get go. So they come in with a, a decent vernacular around business and an IQ around business that's relatively high. And we're taking that relatively high acumen and raising the bar even more. For the designing a business class, I think that our audience is less about people that have high business experience or great business experience, many of these people are folks that 
come from design backgrounds or creative backgrounds that want to learn how the principles of design thinking apply, not only designing products and services, but also to designing business models. And so I think we've got very different audiences in terms of who we're serving with this content. But I also think that people who take IDOU classes are bought in to the power of design thinking and bought into looking at design thinking as a way of not creating things, but solving business problems by putting the needs of people first. And there's another audience for whom they're already bought into design thinking as a general philosophy. Now, how does that apply to designing strategy? How does that apply to designing a business? How does that apply to designing transformation and change? And so IDOU has a variety of classes that focus on how to apply the design methodology to those specific challenges. Um, so what are the, then conversely, what are the takeaways uh, from your experience at IDEO that you're implementing, you know, into your programs at the Kellogg School? It, you know, it, what, you know, for the, um, the educators in the trusted peer entrepreneurship community, you know, what, what can they learn from what you've learned at IDEO, teaching at IDEO? Yeah. Um... You know, I, I think that as I look around at our peer schools and, and others, I think many business schools, and had you asked me this question six years ago, I probably would have given you a different answer than I'd given you right now. But I think people like Steve Blank and like Eric Reese and like Alex Osterwalder have really started to frame entrepreneurship around some of the principles of human-centered design and the importance of starting with people. So customer discovery, customer development. Customer discovery and customer development are very similar to many of the philosophies around human-centered design, which is the more deeply you understand the needs of people, the more interesting ways in which you can solve their problem and the more interesting ways you can reframe the opportunity so that when everybody else is going right, you go left. So I think that, that today I see more and more entrepreneurship curriculum that's pretty well melded between lean um, management, sort of classic management theory, as well as design thinking. And if you think about design thinking in its component parts, which is learn about the world, learn about the needs people have stated and unstated, latent needs, stated needs, have ideas about how you might solve those problems by reframing the problem itself and breaking it down to its design principles and then putting those things back together in ways that might help them. And then iterating on those solutions in increasingly high fidelity as your confidence increases, so does the fidelity of your experiments. I think they're very, very closely aligned. So today, I think many of us are teaching design oriented entrepreneurship without necessarily calling it that. Um, how should friction theory be woven into a university entrepreneurship curriculum? Yeah, uh, well, I'll tell you how I'm doing it. And okay. everybody yeah. will, will have a slightly different take on it. But um, over the course of the, if you think about the modules of my new venture creation class, they're probably similar to others, which is spending a few weeks understanding the needs of people, learning about the world, then synthesizing those data into pointy points of view or reframing opportunities, ideating around solutions, creating prototypes of solutions, prototyping go to market. Um, in some ways, even before thinking about go-to-market strategy or after thinking a little bit about go-to-market strategy, taking a moment with your team and saying, what is it that could stand in our way? What are the four forces of friction? And using a friction map to say, what forces of inertia might be present? And asking ourselves the questions that might be helpful in diagnosing whether or not inertia is there. How far away from the status quo is this new solution? Do people feel like they're being engaged in the process or is it happening to them? What are the forces of effort? How clear is the path forward? How ambiguous is it? How much exertion, physical, mental, or otherwise is required for them to make this change? What are the emotional frictions that might be present? Could somebody feel threatened by this? Whether it's them or somebody related to them, could somebody feel anxious about what this new solution might mean for them or what it might imply to others in their social circles? And then will somebody feel like this is being imposed upon them and if so, how might we engage them in the process? And even just by asking these questions up front, you can spot the sources of friction that may be present and then run additional experiments like you would run for go-to-market strategy, run different experiments about how to minimize those sources of friction as you bring those ideas to market. What are the, so th there are a number of established entrepreneurship and innovation tools like Lean Startup, 
business model canvas, design thinking. We talked about jobs to be done framework earlier, mm -hmm. voice of the customer. Um, and now, you know, you're uh, introducing friction. Um, you know, it, it's, there's a lot for whoever is developing a curriculum for a, an entrepreneurship curriculum at a university. You know, how do you weave all of these? I mean, are they, you know, how to avoid, con, you know, confusing students? Um, well, I can't speak to all of the other methodologies, but I will say with Lean and with Business Model Canvas, they're actually highly complementary. In fact, they're sort of essential to each other. Mm -hmm. And Jobs plays into the Business Model Canvas and Lean by more deeply understanding the needs that people are trying to have solved. I think as you're looking at customer segments in a business model canvas, or as you're looking at customer segments through the lens of jobs, this is also an appropriate time to look at friction as it relates to customers, which is if these are all the things that they're trying to do, if this is all the progress they're trying to make, social, functional, and emotional, what types of resistance might we face social, functional, and emotional to helping them make that progress? So this is another layer of understanding the needs of people and understanding the needs of organization, which of course are comprised of people that might come up later to confound our efforts. And how do we keep an eye on those and devise those strategies to smooth that process early uh, while we've got resources and while we have time and while we have the ability to iterate versus later when we're running low on money and running low on time and wondering why, despite what the market research told us, and despite what all of our user studies told us about how desirable this thing was, why is it that nobody's actually converting? And I think that friction theory helps us understand and decode that to make sure that we're successful in the long run. So um, you're the co-founder of Matter. We talked about that earlier. Um, the, you know, what are the frictions so if you're an, an entrepreneurship center director, you know, what are the frictions, the forces that oppose change, the drag on innovation? What are the frictions that apply to entrepreneurship center directors? Oh boy. <laughs> uh, well, I think if we sort of break them down by category, inertia is a big one, right? Yeah. Especially the inertia of the rest of the enterprise or the rest of the university. Um, universities are creatures of habit. And I don't think that will surprise any of my colleagues who are watching this, that getting a university to change from what they're used to doing to what might be more innovative in the future uh, is bound to enc encounter uh, some issues with inertia. And one of the things that, that we advise entrepreneurs to do, and frankly, that I advise anybody who's leading change to do, is try to make unfamiliar ideas feel more familiar. So rather than presenting radical change as radical change, it's sort of interesting. We talk a little bit in this book about digital transformation. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems that people leading digital transformation have is calling it digital transformation <laughs> because it sounds Herculean. It's like, we're gonna transform the whole organization and it makes it sound so big and like all encompassing that it can intimidate people just by the word. Mm -hmm. And so we talk in the book about a specific organization called Public Digital, which deliberately does not use the word digital transformation, despite the fact that that's exactly what they do. And they try to shrink the size of the problem and create ways to onboard people on into ideas by simplifying and making them smaller and making them more familiar so that when change happens, it happens in a way that makes people a little bit, bit less uh, prone to reactants and helps people overcome some of that inertia. So inertia is a big deal. Um, I think anxiety and, and, and emotion are a big deal. I think people in universities uh, differently, I think, in some extent, but maybe similar to folks in larger enterprises tend to have feelings themselves about what they would like to be doing that are not always consistent with what the strategic direction of the organization is. So even as you're looking at the whole of the university or the your faculty colleagues, recognizing that each of them, despite the fact that they are part of an organization, each of them are human beings and each of them have social, functional and emotional needs that may or may not be aligned with the change that you're trying to create. So trying to be empathic to and understanding how what you're doing may help them functionally, but might not help them or might threaten them socially and emotionally. And so all of this is to say that I think these principles of friction theory apply anytime change is required and I think can help 
not only create a shared language around what these forces are, but have some really concrete and straightforward ways of helping people understand and address them. And, and I may have mentioned this earlier, one of the beautiful things about friction theory is typically once you spot the friction, the solution is relatively apparent. It's not like you've found emotional friction. Now you need to go through months of organizational or behavioral design to come up with a solution. It's like, no, once you spot, excuse me, the underlying concern, now you can understand, all right, well, maybe if we're causing this anxiety by saying it or framing it this way, let's frame it differently to make sure that we're minimizing some of that um, perception in our audience. So simply by spotting it and talking about it and looking out for it, that can be a huge step in the right direction. The Zell Fellows Program at Kellogg is a selective venture accelerator designed to help student entrepreneurs successfully launch or acquire new businesses. Uh, the entrepreneurship through acquisition track of the Zell Fellows Program is designed for students whose path to becoming an entrepreneur invo involves acquiring a small to medium-sized company rather than launching one. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend that other universities offer this kind of program, this track, oh, yeah. as a new approach to entrepreneurship? I don't know that it's a new approach to entrepreneurship. I think it's an approach that people have been taking for generations. I just don't think it's as sexy as the startup entrepreneurship bug that all of us are focused on right now. In fact, if you look at the data, buying an existing business and growing it is far less risky than starting something for scratch, from scratch. It doesn't have the same allure as a disruptor like a Zuckerberg or a Bill Gates or you know, a fill in the blank. But in terms of wanting to be, if you sort of, again, break things down to their component parts, if your motivation to be an entrepreneur is autonomy and wealth creation and freedom and creativity, there are lots of ways of addressing that progress that don't always involve you starting something from scratch. In fact, right now, more baby boomers are in the process of trying to figure out succession plans for their businesses than any time in human history. There is a trillion dollars of value in small businesses that will be shifting from one owner to another in the next couple of years. I just don't think that many young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurial students recognize how accessible that is. And I think many of us hear about business acquisition and we think, well, we must have to be millionaires or we must have to have rich parents or a fund behind us. And I don't think they understand that SBA programs and other types of programs to support these types of acquisitions make it so that if you wanted to buy a business that had a million and a half dollars of EBITDA, really all you have to do is bring $60,000 to the table and an SBA loan. So I think it's much more accessible than people acknowledge. And there is an opportunity happening right now that probably won't happen again for a generation. And so while I think a lot of our attention is focused on startups and startup entrepreneurship, uh, we're missing what might be perceived as a less sexy path to entrepreneurship, but far less risky, um, far more, uh, 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 far shorter timeline to actually getting up and running, but still has the same autonomy and creativity associated with it. One of the biggest risks for startup entrepreneurs is product market fit. If you're buying a business that has a product that's actually been selling, that risk is off the table and your attention instead of product market fit might be how to make things better, how to remove cost, how to add efficiency, how to bring technology to a company that might have outdated processes and procedures. But bringing it back to friction theory, that's a whole different kind of friction, right? Because now you're dealing with the inertia of the way the owner ran the business. You're dealing with the effort of getting people to change, do any sort of transformation, digital transformation, the emotion of transition and the reactance of the workforce to a new owner. That's a different way of using friction theory, but uh, maybe on a future podcast, we can talk about friction theory as applied to M&A because it is a, a rich, is a rich landscape. As the faculty director of the Zell program, you're developing the entrepreneurship curricula for MBA students at a preeminent program like the Kellogg School. Um, however, most first time entrepreneurs across the country have never had formal entrepreneurship training. What would you recommend as a curriculum to America's 1000 small business development centers for coaching and guiding Main Street small business owners on the concept of friction? Um, I think like, and, and I should say, my hope is that like Alex's business model canvas and like lean methodology and like jobs theory, uh, 
um, which we, again, talk a lot about in the context of startups and disruptive change. These tools and frameworks can be equally applied to huge benefit for dry cleaners, for restaurants, for service industries. And so while I think we're biased in assuming that these tools are tools of startup craft, they're just tools of business craft. And I think friction theory is the same. But the one condition I would say is that friction theory is particularly powerful when it's being applied to the adoption of a new idea. If we're talking about a sustaining innovation or an efficiency innovation, there may be some friction present, particularly around those who are going to be implementing the change organizationally. But where friction theory really shines is when you're trying to get somebody to do something different than what they're doing today. Uh, and that's probably how I would distinguish those two things together. Um, through C-19, COVID-19, we have all changed our behaviors to embrace, and some would say live with, remote collaboration. Um, you are the co-founder of Matter, a 25,000 square foot innovation center in downtown Chicago, focused on catalyzing and supporting a healthcare entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Are physical centers for entrepreneurship relevant going forward? Uh, as our behaviors have changed to embrace kind of remote um, engagement? Uh, interesting question. The answer is, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we, previous to COVID-19, had made the assumption that things are always better when they're done in person and that co-working spaces generate lots of uh, serendipitous collisions it's funny, in my own experience, whether it's matter or other co-working spaces, I think we had blindly assumed that that was the way people were the most productive from like 2010, 2011 to 2019, without, out, without really ever having a moment to pause and be like, hey, this thing we've been doing for 10 years, is this actually working? And how are we going to measure its benefit relative to doing something more distributed and more remote? Uh, anecdotally, what I've observed is that matter is being used for certain things that it was intended to do and not being used for other things that it was intended to do. So, for example, it's being used for meetings and events and, and convenings, but we had expected that a lot of companies would be co-working and working in common office space and, and being out in the open. What we found is that people would come to matter for certain purposes and then go to a Starbucks or go to an office to actually put their heads down and get work done. And I'm not an expert on creativity theory or, or how workspaces impact creativity in startup output. But from, again, anecdotal observation, as well as the, the work of some of my peers, I think what we're learning now is that people need this combination of heads down, time to focus and be on their own, as well as the stimulation that comes from interacting with others. Now, whether or not those interactions can happen in uh, virtual format the same way that they can happen in, in in person. My personal belief is is no, particularly if you're building a business and you need to be collaborating in a project space and serendipity and shared thought is really important. Can relationships be maintained uh, virtually? Probably. So I guess my answer to your question is early on in a startup's life, being on site and being in person and having some activity and cohesion and, and, and density is probably a good thing. But once those those relationships are established and those working habits are established, can they be maintained more remotely and more distributed? Probably. You know, how are students learning differently, right? And how do you think that the future of learning is going to change, not only in the immediate future for, say, this academic year, 2021, mm. 22, but also two to three years out? I, you know, it's the... COVID-19 has been a tremendous forcing function in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as someone who has been teaching at the Kellogg School for a number of years, you know, what's changing? What has changed? And what do you see a couple of two, three years out? Yeah, um, I think kind of like the example of co-working spaces, I think it's given us a moment to say, like, why? Why do we do it this way? Like, what, like standing in front of a room of people and delivering content lecture style that we could probably do in a flipped classroom model like Steve has been doing for a long, long time. Like, why is it that we've defaulted to doing things in certain ways when there are other ways that may be effective? So 
I won't speak for others, but what I have begun to do is we've moved back into in-person teaching is there are certain things that I'm recording in advance and letting people watch asynchronously that I will continue to do so that we can maximize the time we spend in the classroom together, workshopping, rolling up our sleeves, diving into content on specific projects or, or use cases that students are dealing with. Um, so, and I also think that for certain learners, having a recorded lecture and being able to go back and rewatch or revisit uh, I'm the type of person that never really learned that well in lectures. I can't write notes as quickly as other people. My memory isn't quite as good. And had I had the ability to go back and say, you know, what did Professor Schoenthal or what did Professor Bouchard say about this mm -hmm. earlier in the quarter where maybe I didn't realize it was important, but it is important. Can I go back and rewatch that? I think it helps people of lots of different learning styles have different ways to access content. So. I think my bias will be to lean on video, not as a replacement for in-person education, but as an amplification or an, uh, a way to augment and amplify uh, how we both memorialize our content, but also how we maximize in-person learning experiences and workshops. David. And by the way, if I were an MBA student and I were thinking like, why am I paying <laughs> X thousands of dollars for this class when I can watch the video online. If I'm doing that cost benefit math, particularly as the price of business education keeps going up at some point, I'm like, what, why am I paying for this? And so I think business school educators and educators in entrepreneurship and business in general need to continue to make sure that the in-class product is worthy of the premium that people pay. And if it's not, you know, our product needs to change. As the faculty director, can you share any decisions um, that you would advise others uh, in the same position to avoid? So the Zell Fellows program is a little different. So Zell Fellows is not entrepreneurship at Kellogg writ large. It's a specific segment of entrepreneurship. These are for students who are determined to run businesses when they graduate. So it's for second year MBA students who know that when they, when they graduate, they want to turn down that job offer from fill in the blank consulting or finance firm and instead make a go at, at building their business. So we've designed this program very purposefully to help students make their businesses as market ready or as funding ready or their theses for acquisition is as funding ready as possible when they graduate. So typically it's about 20 or 30 students a year and they're a very um, focused, they've opted in, like this is, this is what they wanna do. So my experience in Zell might be a little bit different than uh, other people's experiences in more general entrepreneurship programs. But I can tell you, we've designed Zell very specifically, which is that the focus is entirely on the founder. It's on the business secondarily, but what we also know from the data is that successful entrepreneurs, and this is research that was done by one of my fa Kellogg, uh, faculty colleagues, Ben Jones, that the average age of successful entrepreneurs is 42 years old. And the average age of a graduating MBA student from Kellogg is probably somewhere in 30 to 32. So there's a 10 year gap between when they leave our classroom and when it's likely that they're going to found their next thing. And while we may educate them on the discipline of entrepreneurship and the tools of entrepreneurship and how to develop grit and self-reliance and creativity and resourcefulness, it may be 10 years before they actually put that to application. And therefore we view the product we're creating is entrepreneurial thinkers and founders that whether they decide to do it the moment they graduate or they decide to do it in five years, they'll look back on this program as giving them the personal tools and the mental toughness and the resilience to be able to do it successfully. And one of the things we're turning our attention to at the Kellogg School is supporting lifelong entrepreneurship education and not just the two years you're at an MBA program or the two years that you're in an EMBA program or the one week that you're in an executive program, how do we continue to support your entrepreneurial needs as your career and as your preferences and as your personal mission evolve? And, and that's what we're gonna to start to get into earnestly in the next couple of years. Um, last question, David. Um, what would you advise universities and directors that are just starting their entrepreneurship centers and programs? Um, what are the curricular and co-curricular programs that they should start with? I'll give you one. Um, and this is something that we're doing at Kellogg with increasing uh, emphasis is beginning with knowing thyself. That I think a lot of students come in with stars in their eyes about 
building the next great startup, the next billion dollar unicorn, and sort of default to thinking that startup entrepreneurship is the path because it gets the outsized amount of attention without thinking about acquisition entrepreneurship or without thinking about franchising or real estate. There are lots of ways of having entrepreneurial autonomy that are not startups. And depending on what your phenotype is as a founder, maybe the startup path is for you, maybe acquisition is for you, maybe corporate innovation is for you. But I think that all too often in MBA programs, the students don't really realize what their entrepreneurial DNA is until maybe halfway through their second year, at which point it's too late to go back and sort of redo the path. So how we can forefront people's awareness, self-awareness of which path may be right for them so that they can spend the most amount of time pursuing the right path while they're uh, on campus is really a, a focus of our attention going forward. So know thyself is a big one. Fantastic. David, I can't thank you enough. This has been a wonderful interview. Thank you. And thank you for making the time and, and all the great questions.